Mix, I'm playing that audio because I know how much it pains you as a as a, a former All Black who wore the jersey with such pride that those bits of history we don't reclaim anymore. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, no, I, we don't want to make a song and a dance about it, actually, Marty, but, um, yeah, we... You know, it's a revered record that uh, has taken a long time to develop, you know, 80% success ratio over 100 years, which is something that we're all very proud of. Um, you know, in those days, you know, back in the day, you sort of, you were the guardian of the jersey, you know, so I played number eight. So I was the guardian of, of the number eight jersey, and I, I knew all the number eights that played before me, um, you know, because most most players in those days held the position uh, for a while and um, Brian Lahore was my favourite player in those days. I bet. Brian Lahore and Colin Meads but Brian Lahore was a classic number eight um, and my father played in the same position so I certainly felt I had a responsibility and um, sometimes I wonder um, particularly when I hear the media make a comment like he will make his debut off the bench well how do they know he's going to be on the field. I mean, is this premeditated? That's what I'd like to know. I mean, surely if you picked on the bench, it means you weren't picked in the starting lineup, and you go on, uh, if, you know, if the player that's playing your position is having a bad day um, or gets injured or whatever, you don't, you don't go on by right. No. That's one thing that did concern me uh, last week, actually, um, to see these players being subbed. And you sort of couldn't help but feel that you know, it was a sort of a, a token offer. Um, or, you know, you're it's preordained, preordained almost, field. yeah. Almost. So it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, next time I see Fozzie, I'll, I'll ask him that question because uh, it's, an, it's an interesting one. Yeah, so it is sad to see the, uh, the records tumble and uh, there's a bit of consistency at the moment with our inconsistency. Yes. Um, Mix, well, we... You know, when you say... Having said that, mate, we select exactly the same run on 15. And I know when the All Blacks are winning, we do that. I know when we lose, we always think, OK, uh, these guys have got to have a chance to redeem themselves. Four changes to the bench, though. Uh, you know, I mean, is, is this as good as it gets for us? Because I think most of the country kind of went, oh, really? And But, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, who else can he possibly pick at the moment? Are you happy with that run on 15? Well, it's something that I've been talking about on your show for a long time Martin is um, combinations and the value of combinations and all the listeners will, will know Ma Nonu and Conrad Smith um, you know what a fantastic combination uh, and they look like it was a, you know, the perfect balance for the midfield I mean the same could be said about Kieran Reid and Aaron Smith um, and these sorts of partnerships, relationships develop with time on the field knowing how the player feels and plays under under pressure and sometimes you've got to experience that at the highest level not necessarily uh, at provincial rugby level um, to realize you know how to help or how to uh, um, co compromise or or um, improve the situation when your partner that you've played with for so long is under pressure uh, how to ease the load, I was looking for that expression. Sure. And so often you can see it with Conrad Smith. Sort of Ma would have a bit of a ping, wouldn't quite make it. Conrad would just sort of come right off his shoulder, hip, and Ma would pop him the ball, you know, and that was just perfect, you know. Uh, whereas on another occasion, Ma would draw his player and put Conrad away on the outside, and Conrad scored a lot of a lot of tries. So now that's the easiest one to explain it. So I've been very critical of the recent... Um, selection process leading up to the World Cup in Japan where you know there was rotation all the time um, so I was very pleased to see um, a bit of consistency after we won in Johannesburg uh, which was a magnificent victory mm. um, I couldn't help but think you you know if you don't play the same 15 if you don't start the same 15 um, then what why why would you not start the same 15 again against Ireland and they did, which was fantastic. But, you know, back in the day, as I was saying, you know, you, you went out in the field, you did the business, you won the match, and you knew you'd be wearing that jersey in the test match next week. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you went out and you had a few beers because you just knew you would. It's not the same these days, is it? <laughs> I mean, I haven't been on for a couple of weeks with you, but the way I see it is that, 
you know, we, we after the Irish series and that, that third test against Ireland was probably the most disappointing game I've watched live um, that I can remember, actually. Um, you know, in Wellington as well and, and seeing Ireland deserve to win that game, uh, which, you know, the not many Irishmen would have picked that um, before they arrived on our shores. No. So that was disappointing. Um, but then they went and played, um, you know, in South Africa, which is always bloody hard against, you know, the World Cup holders, aren't they? And they're big men and, and, and they're bloody good. They're our greatest adversary. But, um, you know, and we weren't quite good enough. But what we did do is we made some improvement, didn't we? Um, you know, you could see that the line-out was coming right. You could see we had a line-out drive all of a sudden, troubles in the scrum. Then the second test, geez, everything came together. The scrum came right. They made a few adjustments to the front row. Scrum came right. The bloody uh, speed of the ball came right all of a sudden because in the first test, it was stationary ball. In the second test at, at Alice Park, it was go forward ball because we, we went through the centre, picked and goed, and, and uh, the back line was getting great ball. Fantastic. Um, so I was pretty happy actually going into the Argentinian test when I saw the team announced. I thought, put on them, they're on the right track. And, you know, at half time, I wouldn't say it was in the bag, but that's what it felt like. Yeah, it we felt like dominated it. Yeah. Every, every area of the game, you know, possession, line breaks, scrums, line outs, you know, everything was going well. I mean, the only thing the Argentinians were doing um, really was tackling. Um, you know, I think they had to tackle twice as many as our, as we had to. Um, and, of course, you know, they kicked goals. But you've won test so, matches uh, like that, Max. I mean, and, and you know, and, and I know that you know that. You know, winning a test match, as you've told us a million times, isn't about being the flashiest, fanciest side on. It's about scoring more points. And they were smart, mate. They actually adapted to the ref like we didn't. I mean, regardless of his rulings, and I don't think the Georgian guy is a great ref, but you have to adapt on the field. You've told us that a million times. They kicked their goals, they stayed within touch, and in the end, all we did was run one up, one up, and they just tackled us. I thought we'd lost our way. Yeah, I mean, it's how are we going to win this next game? That's the way... That's the yeah, you know, crucial thing, I suppose. Mm. Approach it, and that's the way every all-black team does approach it. Uh, and that's why they picked the same 15, uh, 15 didn't they? Um, but, uh, you know... The funny thing that happened in that game, in my view, is that nobody could believe the, the Argies were still in the game at half time. And we had sort of handled the referee because he was, you know, he needed a chill pill, didn't he? It was, a big, it was his biggest match he's ever had. Why he was given that game, I'll never know. Uh, I suppose they assumed that the All Blacks at home would beat Argentina. And um, he'd probably be a pretty good referee going forward. But, you know, he was trigger happy. And uh, and but that's there's no excuse to no. that. You've got to got to the referee and say, hey, this guy's going crazy. We've got to make sure we, you know, we win this game. How are we going to do it? And so that's why I was disappointed at half time when they came back on the second half. All of a sudden, we stopped driving through the centre. We stopped producing sort of go forward ball. All of a sudden, it was stationary. We we're under pressure, and we froze. You know, I mean, and then all of a sudden, they subbed Smith. Now, why you'd sub the most experienced player in your team, who's one of the strat strategic players, you know, and you had a, a relatively inexperienced number 10 at that level, um, and take off Smith, it was crazy. I mean, and, you know, and, and you'd have to say Moinga went quiet. Yeah, that last no, he did. So, um, you know, that was, a, I think that was a mistake. Uh, and subbing the... the uh, you know, the front row as well, I thought, was a mistake. Well, so, why, though, Mix? I mean, know, it just seems preordained, mate. I think there's a guy with a clipboard somewhere deciding these things. There doesn't seem to be any common sense to it. You always used to say, the last 15 to 20 is about attrition. It's about the mentalness of the game. And I know that we've got eight subs, which drives me crazy these days, because, you know, that whole physical domination by wrecking your opponent and tiring them out doesn't happen now because you sub a whole team. But at the same time, you know, at the crucial crux of the game, don't you want your leaders on? Isn't that the whole point? Yeah, well, that's why that's why Sam Whitelock plays eighty minutes in uh, every bloody game. I can't remember when he was ever. Well, stuck. the Argentinian hooker I did mean, as well, Mix, didn't he? He didn't. He didn't want to come off at eighty minutes, mate. No, and, and uh, I don't think anybody does, except maybe maybe there's a new breed that have expectations of playing twenty minutes. I don't know. I don't think that's 
uh, that's the right way going forward. I mean, I think we're being led down the garden path a little bit by these strength and conditioning guys that say, you know, here's proof that you're 10% less yeah. Um, yeah. powerful uh, after f- 45 minutes of action. Well, you know, I'd say to those people, and, and we've been, you know, working on mental skills at Irons for 22 yeah. years yeah. now. I know. I'd say to them, you know, I'll tell you what, though, if you're, if you're mentally tougher than the guy that's coming on the field because you've played in, you know, you've played in this battle and you've, you're wearing your opponent down and then you get dragged, you know, the new guy comes on, he doesn't have that same edge and steel because he's had to prevail during that time. So the mental strength, to me, you know, drives through that sort of slight loss of, um, of power or speed. Um, which they call fatigue, which I think is a terrible word, because you know when you're playing in a test match, that's why it's called a test match. Yes, you're actually, testing. You're, un- yeah. you're under fatigue the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> be, that's the point. To be blunt. Yeah, especially against the big teams. But every team we play now seems to be seems to be a big team for us. Um, so yeah, so it was a bit disappointing. Well, I want to talk to you about this this loose forward trio, which is your special area, of course. Murray mixed it with us, legend of all back rugby. Okay, we go again. I've got a couple of questions about this. Can you drop your captain? That's Sam Kane at seven. You talk about the combinations here. Ardy at eight, and uh, now we stick with Shannon Frizzell at six. Whereas, uh, no, sorry, Scott Barrett is. Yeah, you've talked about Scott Barrett being in there. Is Ardy actually our best number eight mix? And if he's not, oh, he's a brilliant player and he's got to play. But if he's not. How do you rejig that loose forward combination to get the best out of those players that are there? Yeah, well, firstly, I think that Artie is as good at seven as he is at eight. So let's finish that story. But what you need in a loose forward trio is a balance because there's different roles and there's different skill sets required. And now when you play the big boys, you actually do need two guys that are you know, that are nearly two metres tall. Because you've got to have a line-out option. Reality. Yeah, don't you? Well, because aerial possession has become so important. And that's why I've been banging on about Scott Barrett being, you know, clearly our best blindside flanker in New Zealand at the moment. Because we need the best blindside flanker in New Zealand to be playing blindside every game. Because we've got a seven and eight that are a little bit undersized in comparison to the big teams. And Scott um, you know, Barrett is so magnificent in, in the air, with ball in the air, not only line-outs, kick-offs, but he's really good in that area. So that, that sort of, to me, that complements um, the trio. Um, so yes, we can have Artie in that situation if we've got a Scott Barrett playing, but if you've got a guy that's only, you know, 195 or something like that, or 194, then, you know, your you lose forward trio are going to miss a, a certain amount of possession. Um, which is a bit of a worry because position's key. So, yeah, so that's my feelings. Um, do you drop your captain? No, I, I wouldn't drop my captain. I mean, it's easy for me to say now because the team's been announced. Um, but I was thinking about that because, you see, one of the things that I'm aware of that sometimes we all take for granted is that if you've had time on the f- off the field uh, out of the cut and thrust of Test Match Rugby uh, because you've been injured, and then you come back, are you battle fit? That's my question. Right. And Sam Kane came back after a lot of injuries, and he wasn't battle fit. I remember one of those games three or four test matches ago when he was sort of, you could tell, you know, he didn't have that edge that he had in the past. And so, you know, he probably needs to be playing for 60 minutes. Um, maybe he's... Um, maybe he's the sort of guy that you do sub and that's why you bring on subs. Uh, there's a valid reason for that. Um, but the same thing with Retallick, you know. Um, Retallick's, you know, one of our two uh, world-class locks. Um, absolutely magnificent um, footballer, but has he got test match edge um, starting tomorrow? So I see they haven't started him. No. Which would have been a temptation to start him. So... You know, that's a good decision, I think. Well, wh- and he, okay, he'll let's probably re- come on. Well, let's reverse the decision. Mix, if he's going to come on, why wouldn't you start and put Barrett at six and bring him off? If he's actually able to play, he's obviously able to play for some minutes, wouldn't that be a more intelligent thing to do? Put him on to start with. Otherwise, you're going to try and bring him on and get him into the rhythm of the game. 
That doesn't make sense to me. Well, that's an option, Martin. That's an option to do that, where you could start them and say, "Give us, give us what you've got." Yeah. And uh, and then we'll replace you, and that, and that means you might only last twenty five minutes, but you don't know, do you? Because I, I read something. Um, I'm reading Stephen Adams' book at the moment, Marty. Yeah. And um, I I read something in the and I often see things that he's written that uh, you know that I think are absolutely the same with rugby. But he wrote, "No training, no matter how hard or competitive, can replicate the intensity of game situation." Now that's the reality. Absolute reality in rugby. Yeah. So you know how long's Retallick been out? I don't know. Um, well, he it's didn't probably play a month, isn't it? Yeah, about a month, and then he played a little bit of Hawks Bay on the weekend. Oh, he, I don't know, Mix. I'd argue with you that he's one of those guys, mate. He's got the experience, he's got the desire, he's got the hunger, he's got the he's got the gnarl about him. That put him in, mate. He's like he's like all all, all blacks who played eighty tests. You've got it. If you've played that many tests, you know what to do, surely. But he's just sort of getting up to a gallop, though, isn't he? Because he came back from Japan. He had a bit of time in Japan, wasn't he? And uh, you can get away with things at that level. You can't get away with the test matches. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he was playing, I think, below his, his best, even though he was still still the best lock. He and Sam were the two best locks in the country. But, um, you know, he's got more to give yet. And uh, I reckon we'll see it. So I don't know... Um, you know, would you start him? It's a it's a fifty fifty call, okay. and there's there's merit both ways. There really is. All right, can but, I finish uh, on this? Then I need to ask you about this before we go. Roger Tuivasa-Sheck, who was obviously a million dollar acquisition from rugby league, and I'm just presuming that because he was paid a million dollars by the Warriors, and most people don't go down in salary. What do you do with this guy, mate? I mean, so much expectation on him, um, and yet he he's not being picked to play. You know, is, has he got a free pass into that squad? Because, you know, to me, you've got to earn the right to play regardless. And if he's not actually up to it, well, then why don't they just put him back in NPC and wait till he is? Well, I think that um, you've actually answered your own question there, Martin. Um, he's definitely got the potential, there's no doubt. And he's got to, um, you know, get up to that level where they they consider I'm not a specialist midfield back, uh, up to the level they, um, they want. And I think with game time, he will get there. I mean, let's not panic. Um, the Rugby World Cup is next year. Okay. Uh, he should be playing as much uh, MPC before that, or and Super Rugby and Rugby Championship as you can, as 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 we can give him. But um, no, I don't think that's the thing. I, what, what I'd like to see though is is um, some serious thought about the loose forward trio uh, going forward because you know you've heard me talk about the blindside flanker. You've heard me talk about an underdone Sam Kane, mm. and is there an option, and there is the option is of playing um, Artie as well as Sam. So those two, I still think, are our best two open-side flankers in the world because they address the core role of an open-side flanker, you know, retain and regain. Um, and But if you moved Sam off because he was sort of tiring and um, and you bought on, bought, moved Artie into seven, that would be great. Well, who's Who eight play then? At eight? Who's eight? Well, tell me, tell me who our I best reckon, number eight is, mate. Karen Reed's our best number eight. Yeah, no, take that bloody <laughs> that cap that pretty <laughs> cap he wears on television <laughs> and go back on the sort of scrum and, and get on the and get on the field. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, in, in all fairness, the two people that they are looking at are so cooler and um, and uh, Satutu from yeah Satutu from the Blues, but I don't reckon. Um, I don't know this, but I think there's a third one there. Um, I'm hoping, like hell, the selectors none of them were none of the selectors are Liz forwards. But I'm hoping, like hell, they are thinking about Papali at number eight because I don't think he's an open side flanker because that's not his forte. Retain and regain. His forte is a brace of uh, running with the ball, um, speed, a brace of defence. You know, it's, he's got the hallmark of a number eight. And he's actually, according to the stats, he's six foot four. He's one ninety three, so you know that's better than one ninety or one eighty nine. Um, and he, to me, he looks like it. I believe, I'm not sure, but St Kennigan said he play at number eight. I think for the first fifteen, I thought he did. Um, so you know, that's what I'd be doing. Okay. I'd be, I'd be putting him on the bench, and I've done that. So that's bloody good. And I hope when, if and when they decide to sub Kane. They'll probably, well, hopefully they'll push Artie to seven and bring on Papi Ali at eight. That's what I'd like to see. 
And by that stage, you, you'll have Retallick and at lock, and you can move um, um, Barrett, Scott Barrett to blindside. And yep. wow, that's a forward pack, isn't it? Mix, thank you for that as always. Murray Mix did the Irons Insight, and that's International Rugby Academy of New Zealand joining us. Appreciate your time.